to my podcast, Where the Dark Corners Are. Dark Travels hostess. Tonight, we head to the land of gangsters, ghosts, and, like, death. I'm, of course, speaking of the city of Chicago. And I literally had my pick of haunted places in Chicago. So, obviously, one of these days down the road, I will be returning to the Windy City. And I just, I, it's, I'm pretty impressed, Chicago. I'm, I'm really impressed to how haunted you guys really are. So, let's go Chicago Dark. For our first stop in Chicago, we're going to start with Chicago's Grand Roman Catholic Church, the Holy Name Cathedral. Believe it or not, this church has a very curious situation going on. You see, on the morning of October 11th, 1926, a Al Capone rival by the name of Jaime Weiss was leaving the church when he was met with a spray of bullets that basically killed him. And the clincher is, to this very day, these bullets are still very visible. And why would a church allow bullet holes? to remain in the side of their building that killed a man? Well, apparently, these bullet holes absolutely cannot be patched. Apparently, whenever they try to repair or apply motor, whatever it is that they think is going to you know, sm- fill in the bullet holes and smooth out the, uh, you know, the patch, the holes... The mortar actually refuses to dry, and then it basically just falls out, like refuses to dry and runs right out, or the mortar will dry, and it'll like pop out. So it's as if the ghost of Weiss is like, no, 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 no. This is where I died. We're going to mark this territory. It's mine now. And, I mean, we're talking almost 100 years ago, and this is a... A very strange and curious situation that's been going on ever since. And, you know, of course, they do tours in Chicago. And people have noticed unexplained orbs of light surrounding this particular area. And just, you know, just a crazy story. I mean, what's the deal? (laughs) But speaking of Uncle Al, let's talk about the incident that eventually would lead to his undoing. I'm, of course, referring to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. At approximately 10.30 a.m., of course, on St. Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1929, at a garage located on 2122 North Clark Street in the Lincoln Park neighborhood of Chicago's north side, seven gangsters meet up at this garage when four men, two who were dressed as police officers, but I'm kind of eh, on this, and I'll tell you why in a second. And two who were basically dressed to the nines in the suits and long coats, wingtip shoes, and nice hats, order the seven gangsters up against the wall. And while two of the men were using Thompson submachine guns, all four of them, the cops and the guys in the suits, literally gunned down the seven they just had lined up against the wall. Now, these seven men include five members of the George Bugs Moran Northside Gang. So this is why they're on the north side. And of these victims, one of them is actually Moran's second-in-command and brother-in-law, Albert Knechel. It's I, Kakashel. 
I don't know. Okay, but his alias is James Clark, along with the bookkeeper and business manager for the gang, a gentleman by the name of Adam Hare, along with a operations manager, a gentleman by the name of Albert Weinshank, and gang enforcers Frank Goonsberg and Peter Goonsbergs. I think maybe they were brothers. Along with two collaborators who were shot. We're talking a Reinhardt Schwimmer and an occasional mechanic for the Moran gang, a gentleman by the name of John May. Now, as strange as it seems, this barrage of bullets, the slaughter, this massacre, spray of bullets actually does not catch the attention of the local neighborhood people, which I think is a little telling. And neither does the cries of the men dying in agony. Believe it or not, it's actually a dog by the name of Highball who's tied to the axle of one of the trucks in the garage when this all goes down. His howling, crying, snarling, just making a lot of ruckus is actually what catches people's attention as to what something's wrong. Why is that dog not stopping? So they go down to check on the dog, and that's when they discover these seven bodies. So, and Highball survives, you know, but then that's kind of essential. And so the police roll up, and as they're inspecting the bodies, they come across Frank Gusenberg, and Frank is still alive. Now, what I'm about to share is literally the most gangster shit I have ever heard. So they take him to the hospital and the doctors were able to stabilize him. And despite the fact that he was shot 14 times, and again, this is 1926. So this is, this is pretty fucking miracleness. But once he gets stabilized, the, the doctor's like, if you have any questions, you better ask him now. So, of course, the police go in, and they're like, Frank, Frank, who did this to you? And motherfucking gangster replies, no one shot me. Again, dude has 14 fucking bullet holes in him, and he's like, nope, nope, I wasn't shot, wasn't me. And then he dies like three hours later. So even as he's motherfucking dying, he straight ain't a rat. I mean... That's that's something I gotta tell you. I'm impressed with Frank, but either way, as for the the wall, the infamous wall. Okay, so you don't know this, and I actually do know this because I've been there. The wall gets removed and is relocated to the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I actually really love this museum. This museum is well done. I am getting off topic because now we're in Nevada, but. It's a great museum. If ever you go there, they have the speakeasy in the basement for your bootleg and alcoholic needs. But either way, that's where you can actually see where these guys literally bit the bullet. But getting back to Chicago. So at this particular site, the garage is no longer there. The wall is no longer there. But at this particular site, people have reported the sounds of machine gun fire. Obviously phantom because it's not happening. The cries of the dog is still happening. Disembodied dog barking. People have actually seen dark gangster-like figures with fedoras, like the shadows, hanging out there. And people around the area swear that after it snows, sometimes you can even see the outline of the seven bodies that died there on February 14th. 1929. So, this is a hotbed. I mean, you you kill seven people. And the thing is, going back to what I mentioned earlier about the police in uniform, the police were actually looking for a little revenge themselves because the Moran gang, I'm fairly certain it was them, had killed the son of one of the police chiefs. So they were a little pissed. So could it have been cops in legit uniforms? Probably, maybe, I don't know. I wasn't there. But Frankie knew, and he wasn't ratting nobody out. So, all right. So moving on from the St. Valentine's Massacre, let's talk about Chicago's Water Tower. Now, this is pretty impressive, and this actually 
this water tower has come into my attention recently for other reasons, but let's talk about it. The paranormal aspect is going on. So this water tower was actually built in 1869, so we're talking three years after the Civil War, the American Civil War. And as of today, it still stands as the second oldest water tower in America. Located on Michigan Avenue, this is one of the very few buildings that actually survived the Great Fire of Chicago in 1871, so two years after it's built. So speaking of the fire, here's kind of where things start to go dark. There is a legend that says during the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, as fire was basically leveling Chicago, in particularly Michigan Avenue, this guy, they don't know his name, they can't even verify that this really even happened, but we're going to talk about why they think it did. As the flames of the fire basically started getting closer to the tower, this lone pump man climbed to the top And he was there to kind of help regulate the pumps, the water pumps. But when it got too much, and when the man thought for sure he was going to go, instead of letting the smoke, the fire, the flames get him, he opted to hang himself rather than burn to death. So as a result, even today, tourists and locals alike swear that they see a man hanging from the water tower. It even gets to the point where the cops get called. The cops will even see the hanging figure and go and inspect, but nothing. There's nothing. Now, the key elements here is this building was built with limestone, and it has water. And every paranormal investigator knows that certain elements like limestone and water in particular holds memory and has these elements that, you know, not make paranormal activity happen, but is definitely a conductor of paranormal activity. Now, the story of the hanging man is not the only sad incident that has happened here. In 1875, so four years later, a German man by the name of Frederick Kaiser, who had, you know, dealt with a lot of depression, he had been at one point in his life Uh, admitted into a a mental institution. And despite the fact that things appeared to be looking better for this gentleman, he just couldn't do it. He he suffers from this horrible mental breakdown on October 21st, again, 1875. And right after he eats a little dinner, he manages to sneak into the, the water tower and he leaps to his death. Now, six years later, so we're talking 1881, another German gentleman by the name of Hugo von Malaper, and this guy, you know, he had money, but it just didn't work out for him in terms of, I don't know, bad investments. Things just went downhill for him once he came to America. And as it was, he bumps into another German gentleman by the name of Victor Ginkelin. I'm probably mispronouncing that right in front of the water tower. And Malpert says, hey, how you doing? And Gingling's like, hey, things aren't going well. And at this point in time, Malpert tells Gingling that he's not happy in America. Shit's gone south since he migrated over to the New World. And Gingling's like, no, no, you should try and, you know, make this work. This is a great country, you know. And in the course of their conversation, Gallagher relates to him how he's like, well, you know, I know things are really tough because I'm things are really tough for me, too. And Malapert at this point goes, hey, you know what? You should check out this company because I'm a clerk there and they're going to have an opening. So you should go down there and check it out. So the two men part. And after they part, Malapert, who had already made up his mind, manages to make his way up to the water tower commits suicide, and hence that's how come he knew that the company that he was working for was going to have an opening. Between the trio of these deaths, it is believed that the ghosts of both of the German gentlemen and this unnamed hero is still lurking around the water tower. For And, I mean, as I said before, so people see the guy hanging, but because it's a now a historic public place, visitors 
have reported the overall sensation of feeling dread or sense of uneasiness. People have taken pictures where orbs will mysteriously appear in the photos. And it has been said that people have even been touched by by things that aren't there. So, however, the most curious story actually occurs in the late 1980s. So... And, of course, this this should come to no surprise to us paranormal hunters. This incident occurs during renovations of the water tower. And everybody knows the second you start banging on walls, messing things up where the ghosts know where things belong, they get a little active. So here's what happened. One night, the Chicago Fire Department, so it's probably the guy that died, you know, keeping the pumps going, began receiving numerous calls from the building. The problem is, because of the renovation, all of the phone service, and this was back when we had landlines, had been shut off, and so it was literally impossible for any calls to go through or be received at any point in time. But either way, the Chicago Fire Department was receiving telephone calls from this building. So, of course, Chicago. I mean, what's the deal with that? Chicago seems to have a lot of fires. You know, Mrs. O'Leary's cow only did it once, guys. You know, the cow kicked it over. She winked her eye. It said to be a hot time in the old town tonight. Fire, fire, fire. Okay, everyone knows that song. Point is, because of all, I don't know what Chicago's deal is with fire, it comes to no surprise that the most deadliest theater fire in the United States history actually happens here. So, of course, I'm speaking of the tragedy that happened at the Iroquois Theater in 1903. So, I mean, we're just talking, you know, you guys are just having centuries of problems. So, in 1903, at about 3.35 on December 30th, during a matinee performance of Mr. Bluebeard Jr., the curtains hanging near the stage of the Iroquois Theater catches fire. For some reason, there was fire used in the middle of the performance. And at this time, again, it's matinee and it's the holidays. This performance is actually attended mainly by women and children. And because of the many fire code violations, and this is an ornate building with just nothing but wood, the fire spreads quickly. And because of... Just poor architectural decisions. We're talking one grand staircase instead of several that leads out to the bottom floor. One grand staircase that all of the balcony and the upper floors can only use. Basically, the patrons get trapped. And so we're talking blocked accordion gates. So here's what that deal was. In the upper levels, the... uh, the manager put these block gates up to prevent people who paid for the cheap seats to sneak on down for the better seats. So, and, and as a as a as a means to prevent that, but because he did that, he blocked people from exiting the upper levels. So people basically were stuck there. In addition to that, a lot of the exits on the ground floor were covered by curtains, so people didn't even know that they were there. And those that did know that they were there, the doors were not unlocked during the performance. The ushers just forgot to do it. So a lot of the exits to even get out of the building were locked. There were no fire alarm. There were no sprinkler systems. And bear in mind, this building was actually deemed fireproof. Like, the Iroquois Theater is the gem to behold. It is absolutely fireproof. It was like part of the advertisement. So everybody is rushing to get on the one single staircase and even members of the performance, they're bailing, they're trying to get out. Everybody's trying to get out. The the audience is trying to get out. And some of the people, unfortunately, who knew that they weren't going to make it literally began jumping off of the balcony to their deaths. Some were surrounded by smoke and flames and basically settled into what they knew was their last moments and just sat down. And and unfortunately, that's how the firemen found them. And this was such a horrendous moment. And and everyone's panicking, screaming, trying to get out. 
that it was said that the firemen would find corpses stacked as high as 10 feet high around some of the blocked exits. I mean, and people are just climbing over them to get out. You understand. And of course, for everyone who's trying to get out, there's this one guy, Bishop Muldoon. He sees what's happening. He runs into the building. He climbs into the balcony and he's trying to direct everyone, you know, this way, come this way. He's trying to rescue people, as many people as he can. And as he's doing it, he's offering sacraments to the Roman Catholics in the theater in case they don't make it out. And, I mean, he's doing his best to help people get out. So, I mean, he's got a little firefighter in him. And (laughs) the fact that he's like, you know, he's shouting, do you wish to confess anything in case you don't get out? You know, just. That I I have this image of this guy, this priest, over here, over here, follow me, children. God bless you. You know, you know any last uh, com- minute confessions, bedside confessions. I just, but I mean, the guy's a hero, and he sticks with evacuating people until he feels like he's able to get as many people out before he allows authorities to escort him out. And I mean, and people are finding everything they can. In fact, a group of people were starting to use the coal chutes to get out. And unfortunately, a group of girls get stuck. However, they do actually get saved from the firemen. And in fact, that's that's just it. One of the stagehands was told to run the several blocks it took to go to the most closest fire department to signal to get help, help because there's no phones. Again, they didn't have enough fire alarm, nothing. So this guy's a hero. And as they're pulling bodies out, you know, in a safe place, they're running around with mirrors to see who's still breathing and who's not. And the very curious thing, this is when they actually start using oxygen to help resuscitate people. So, I mean, unfortunately, out of tragedy comes a lot of shoulda, woulda, coulda, next time we'll do better. This is how. However, between being asphyxiated by the fire, the smoke, and there's gases because once it hits certain parts of the building where gases uh, were stored. The building has ex- some explosions going on. Or being crushed to death by the pure panic of everyone trying to get out. It is believed that initially 575 people were killed on December 30th. And later on, another 27 will get killed. A total of 602 people will die. The, the 27 will come later due to the injuries in the following weeks. Now, in 1904, the theaters reopened as the Colonial. That eventually gets torn down in 1925. It gets rebuilt as the Oriental Theater and is open in 1926. And this building still stands today. However, in 2019, it gets renamed the Nederlander Theater. So, with the death of 602 people, you are guaranteed to have paranormal activity. So let's talk about what's going on. People have actually seen apparitions fall to their deaths from the balconies. People have heard children crying. People have felt cold spots. People have been touched by unseen entities. The staff have heard the toilets flushing and the restrooms when nobody's there or girls giggling when the flushing is happening. And the most obvious is people can smell the smell of smoke, especially in particular in the area dubbed Death Alley, you know, for the obvious reasons. Ghost hunters love going to this theater. There's just so much activity. But the one story that sticks out, a stage manager stepped outside to have a cigarette. And while he's just thinking his thoughts, reliving his life, his good decisions, his poor choices, He hears a voice say to him, smoke will kill you. And so he's like, what? He looks up and he sees a woman in a periodic hoop skirt and big hat standing before him, looking at him and then vanishing right before his very eyes. So take it from the ghosts. Smoke will kill you. All right, we've talked about gangsters. We've talked about theaters. Let's talk about the Liars Club. Located at 1665 West Fullerton, this club was formerly known as the River East. 
And it is the site of two axe murders and a Coca-Cola bottle killing. I'll say that again. A Coca-Cola bottle killing. So, at this particular club, there are some apartments upstairs. And, as it was in 1958, an abusive husband met his end by a wife who had had enough of the abuse. And she, taking an axe, made him an ex. Get it? He was axed. <laughs> Alright, that was a poor joke. But, this death is actually followed by the very curious killing in 1968. I mean, I just, you know, side note, doing these podcasts just really gives you a very different perspective of what the 1950s was like, the 1920s was like, the 1960s was like. Because you think of, you know, leave it to beaver, and that mentality, and it just does not seem to be an accurate portrayal. But either way, back to 1968 and this story. At this time, this building was a homeless shelter for men. And as it was, two gentlemen, one by the name of John Parlia and the other by the name of Samuel Castile, get into an argument in the second floor regarding a pair of pants. Castile accuses Parlia of stealing the pants from him. When things erupt, Castile will grab a Coke bottle and beat John Parlia, who, by the way, is 70, with the Coke bottle in his hand. And in the course of the fight, Castile will shove Parlia out of the window, killing him upon impact. Now, that's two murders. Let's talk about the third. In 1986, a little more recent. Well, 36 years recent. Now, at this time, we're talking a married couple, a Frank and Julia Hansen. Julia was described as a large woman, and Frank was described as a tiny man. And she kind of harassed him, chuckled him, heckled him for his sign, and finally he flipped his fucking switch, grabbed an axe, and dismembered her in the apartment. Now, he actually waits a couple of days because he leaves the, the hacked body of Julia in the apartment for six days, after which, on a Tuesday afternoon, Frank's like, I guess I should call somebody, calls the cops and reports that old Julia has been axed to death, and he's single now, in the apartment. So, between the two axe murderers and the unfortunate Coca-Cola bottle incident, people believe that the essence of these three murderers are still in the building. Customers have claimed to see the body of Julie Henson. Remember, she was a large woman, described as a large woman. And she's been seen hanging around uh, the area where she was murdered. People have also seen a gentleman wandering up and down the stairs whom they believe to be the unfortunate John Par- Parlia. Staff has even seen a figure of a person, a ghostly figure, against the bar because, it's again, it's a club now. It's a bar. And others have reported the curious incident of having someone tug at their arm when nobody is around. Kind of sounds like people are still kind of hanging around despite being brutally murdered there. And, I mean, why not? I mean, if it's a club and it's playing music, I mean, who doesn't want to get jiggy with it these days? But the point is is that this place is very much haunted. All right, so we've talked about places you can go where it's paranormal if you want to catch a a play. We've talked about a place where you can go if you want to say a prayer and see where gangster good old Weiss was killed. If you really wanted a paranormal experience and you needed a place to hold up hotel-wise, let's talk about the Congress Hotel. Originally built in 1893, it was originally intended to house the World's Fair's guest when Chicago hosted the World's Fair in 1893. This building actually does not become the Congress Plaza Hotel that we know it, as until 1908. 
Now, of course, this lovely building, and it looks lovely from the pictures. I don't know what it really looked like in the early days, but there's, of course, rumors circling its ownership with Al Capone or that he lived there. What we do know, because it's not believed he owned it or lived there, but what we do know is he was known to frequent the place because he loved playing cards there every Friday in one of the hotel meeting rooms. And to this day, some say they can hear the sounds of a rowdy card game still being heard from behind locked doors, especially late at night. And other people have claimed to have seen Al Capone walking around from time to time in the halls. And, I mean, he's even dolled up still in his 1920s get-up gangster outfit. And the thing about Al Capone is that his ghost has been seen in a lot of places. He's kind of like Mary Queen of Scots like that, where he's here, he's there. I mean, the man died in Florida, but it is believed he pretty much left his heart and soul in Chicago. But moving on, let's talk about other paranormal activity that is happening as well. So the 12th floor is the most notorious floor. There is a story that comes out in 1939 where a woman by the name of Adelaide Langer comes to this hotel with her two sons, a six-year-old Carl and a four-year-old Jan. They actually leave Czechoslovakia from the goddamn Nazis. They come to America, and they come to Chicago in particular to be next to Langer's aunts. But she's married, and she's waiting for her husband to join them. However, unfortunately, after a few days, he does not show up. So the days turn into weeks, and Mrs. Linger becomes very distraught. She's not able to find work, and she's in a foreign country, and it's just, it's, it's overwhelming. She's by herself. She's got two boys. So after taking Carl and Jan to the zoo, the Lincoln Park Zoo, she's like, we're going to just take a little jump, y'all. And she opens up the window of the room, and she hurdles both of the boys out onto the sidewalk and then leaps to her own death right after. Now, here's where things start to get really curiously paranormal. Although all three of the bodies are found for some reason, Carl's body never makes it to the city morgue. However, it is believed that old Carl is hanging around the halls of the 12th floor. And even security. It's like, hey, who are you? What are you doing here? The security person who had this incident was like, this kid just smiled at me and then vanished like that right before his eyes. And, you know, the kid's hanging around. He's like, hmm. So that's the ghost boy that tends to hang out at the Congress Hotel. Let's talk about the shadow man. In 1900, a gentleman by the name of Captain Lewis Awesome he was actually getting married. He had stayed at the hotel the night before. He was part of the first United States artillery during the Spanish-American War. Unfortunately, he was traumatized. We're talking post-traumatic stress disorder. And, of course, prior to World War II, none of that even is on the scale of mental health spectrum. And, unfortunately, he suffered from night terrors, among other symptomatic problems and he just happened to have a very particularly brutal and distressing night terror and he basically decides to end it right then and there and he shoots himself in the head now it is believed that his spirit is seen in many areas of the hotel he's considered the shadow man part of what they think might be going on is, is that the captain they call him captain lou might still be searching for the woman he had planned to marry. But again, just like the ghost boy, security's chasing him, looking around. There's even one instance where security guard even chases him all the way to the roof. And by the time the security guard makes it up there, there's like nobody up there. He's chasing shadows. Now, another individual that they believe is hanging out is a homeless hobo. This must have been around the 1920s because we don't really say hobo so much. By the name of Peg Leg Johnny. It is believed that Peg Leg was murdered in the hotel many years ago. Again, my guess is the 1920s. And it is said 
that a wooden-legged man likes to show up in various places of the hotel. And when he does, you'll hear about it because he makes noises. He likes to push chairs around. He'll slam doors. And he likes to play with the lights. He likes to flicker them on and off. So you got the kid running around. You got the shadow man running around. You got a wooden leg man running around. And so some of the things that people tend to experience, one particular person said, when I slept on the 12th floor, I had my pillows being pulled off of me. There was constant knocking at my door all night long. They've heard people talking. In fact, a woman said, my daughter and I heard two gentlemen whispering at the end of our bed. So the 12th floor is littered with ghosts. In fact, there's even a room that is sealed off from the outside to prevent people getting into it. So, I mean, if that's not a sign, y'all, if they're not sealing off doors, nothing else is. Let's talk about some very specific rooms. It is believed that room 666 is closed. I couldn't find out why. I didn't see why. But it is believed that room 1408, if this sounds familiar, it was a movie. And it is believed that this particular room was the one that inspired Stephen King. However, the room that claims them all, you know, the ring, the ring to rule them all, is room 441. It is believed that those who stay there are very likely to be attacked whilst in bed by a shadow woman. In fact, there's even an, a curious incident in, in 2014, so it's still happening, that an Australian celebrity chef by the name of Pete Evans who, who said, I'll, I'll take this on, room 447, he falls asleep, and the next thing they see is him literally fleeing, running from the hotel without even looking back. So whatever happened, uh, <laughs> something bad must have been cooked up. Get it? Get it? Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about other things that they know. There is the belief that a workman was supposedly buried behind the walls, and as such, there is a situation where there's a hand of mystery. Supposedly, his the apparition of his gloved hand will stick out of walls in the closet behind the balcony in the gold room. And speaking of the gold room, it is believed for some reason, because they host a lot of weddings there, sometimes in the pictures, the bridesmaids of the wedding party, they don't show up like they're vampires or something. I don't know. And speaking of ballrooms and grand rooms, it has been said that people often hear voices in these ballrooms when they were otherwise empty. I mean, obviously, this place is just laden with death. People dying everywhere. All right. So this is what I have for you tonight. On to business. Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Uh, We have a Facebook page if you're curious or interested. Look us up. Send an invite. If you have a topic you would like for us to cover or a serial killer or a city that you would like us to do because you know you're on your way there, send me an email at where the dark corners are at gmail.com. But until next time, please remember, only the few can find the beauty in the darkness, which is why we hope to meet you where the dark corners are. Mm-hmm.